name is Francesco Iello, and uh, I recently completed my PhD with Edinburgh Napier University and uh, Arsenal Football Club. And uh, currently, I'm working as a lecturer at the UCB in Manchester. So today, I will uh, present one of my PhD studies during which uh, we tried to conduct a systematic review to evaluate what are the activities that lead to injuries in, uh, in football players. Um, so before to go into it, I think uh, it, it's nice to have a, just a, bit of, a little introduction. So we are all aware of the importance and the difficulty to, of reducing injuries in football and in any sport. So uh, let's see how understanding the exciting activities, so how injury happen, how this can help us with our goal that is at the end of the day to try reducing injuries. So the first reason for why we should care is that it, they, this information can inform the development of uh, playing rules that might help to reduce injuries. Uh, the most recent example is from 2019, I think, and simply was that a change in the rule of, of on the use of the upper extremity during heading reduced the risk of head injuries by roughly 30%. Um, the second reason is that uh, understanding the setting activities can help the identification of relevant activities to investigate from a biomechanical perspective or in other perspective, but in a controlled condition. And this is very important because uh, as we unfortunately know very well, uh, there are honestly, there are limited resources for resources for research. Therefore, it's very important to prioritize the area to focus on. Uh, a very easy example is the ACL injury. So knowing that ACL injuries occur during change of direction and landing allows us to focus uh, biomechanical analysis on these activities rather than others. And uh, of course, the same approach is used for other injuries such as the hamstring, uh, ankles, and so on. The third reason is that knowing how injuries occur help us to hypothesize potential causes and causal pathways that, of course, we need them to test. Again, using the ACL injury, which is the, probably the most known, uh, knowing that the injuries occur due to dynamic valgus, due to an increased load on the tissue, led to the identification of factors such as muscle strength, menstrual cycle, facial menstrual cycle, and many others. Uh, that may increase the risk of suffering injury. So this information then can, can then be uh, used to hypothesize kind of causal pathways and uh, then test them. Again, same principles apply to any other injury. Last, but absolutely not the least, is that understanding how injuries occur is uh, uh, one of the key steps required to develop injury prevention strategies. Uh, I'll touch a bit more into this in the next slide very quickly. So um, I'm sure everyone is aware of this, but it's quite simple how we can reduce injuries. So to, prevent, to develop injury prevention strategies, we need to have uh, an understanding of the extent of injury, understanding of the mechanism, so how injuries occur, an understanding, of, an understanding of the risk factors, and then we can use all this information to create, to try to develop injury prevention strategies that, of course, need to be tested and developed, develop, tested and refined accordingly. So uh, let's touch very quickly on uh, what are the current hypotheses on the mechanism of the most or the most uh, frequent injuries in football. Uh, for ACL injuries, it's quite recognized that the most common mechanism of ACL injuries are a sum of knee valgus uh, and internal rotation, or a sum of knee flexed varus and external rotation, or uh, knee hyperextension. With reference to the hamstring injuries, they have been categorized into two main mechanisms, which is the stretch type and spring type. The stretch type uh, is believed to occur mostly to the semimembran osseous, and it's a bit less common. While the spring type is more common and is believed to occur mostly to the long head of the BC femoris. Uh, lastly, for adductor injuries, uh, they are believed to occur with the knee flexed and the hip abducted. Uh, so 
there are systematic reviews on biomechanics of some injuries, such as the ACL. However, uh, there, there were none available regarding the football-specific activities leading to injury. So since all what I said so far, since that is important to understand how injuries occur to develop prevention strategies to inform for the research, we aim to conduct such systematic review uh, to analyze the injuries in football at all levels in both uh, males and females. Uh, with reference to the methods, we run a, a classic systematic review. Uh, so I, I'll go very quickly on the methods. Uh, we included any profession, any football player, as long as it was non-recreational as, and as long as they were over 13 years old, simply because we wanted to standardize the, um, the playing rules. And of course, the studies had to report uh, uh, the activities leading to uh, injuries in football. Um, this uh, is um, probably the most important methodological uh, note. Uh, so during the data extraction, we noticed that the studies reporting the activities uh, very differently. For example, one study reported that some injuries occurred during uh, kicking, and others uh, reported uh, more details, maybe the injuries occurred during shooting or passing or crossing or same things for, for the running. Someone, some studies reported just running, which is very broad, while others went more in detail and reported running at high speed, accelerating, decelerating, uh, running at low speed. So when we had to analyze the data, it was very complicated. And this led to two decisions. The first one is that we did not run a meta-analysis simply because the data were too, too much not, not aligned, let's say. So we, didn't re we weren't really confident about running a meta-analysis with data we couldn't really understand very well. And the second uh, decision was that we decided then to uh, analyze data just in a descriptive way. But to do so, we still had to do some work on the data. So we decided to categorize all the data into these categories. Uh, simp a simple example, uh, all the running activities that refer to high intensity activities, accelerating, sprinting, high intensity, high speed, were categorized into high intensity. The same for kicking, all the passing, clearing, shooting, uh, uh, kicking, uh, uh, were categorized as a kicking. This is, uh, of course, ar was arbitrary, so it's, it's, a, it's a subjective, but it was really necessary because we, otherwise, analyzing data would have been very, very difficult. Um, another thing that we put much effort on was the analysis of risk of bias. This is because uh, we really, really, really believe that high, that research that the quality of research is very important to inform the decisions. So we wanted to evaluate the, the, the quality and the risk of bias in the studies so that we knew how much data we were analyzing and discussing, uh, we, could, we could trust them. So uh, I, I will touch just on the main points of the risk of bias, the paper is much more detailed. So the first things we analyze is the study population. So um, we wanted to understand if the study population was described in enough details. Um, this is important because this is important for the applicability of the, of the results. Uh, for example, if I, I, I conduct a study and I say, I analyzed the injuries in 20 football players. I didn't tell you anything about the age, the sex, the, the level the playing level the nationality so how can you know if you can use my study to inform the decision you're going to make on your athletes if you don't know the age of my athletes the sex of my athletes the profession the level the playing level of my athletes so this was very important for us the second thing i want to talk to touch on is the case definition and uh, unfortunately this is very common in football. If there are at least 10 systematic reviews that I can remember at the moment 
that uh, reported that many uh, studies in football uh, conducted on injuries did not use uh, the standard injury definition, which is available since 2006 and now has been updated in, uh, in January. Um, so we wanted to make sure to, to, to check a list of how which case definition was used. And the second point, uh, the third and last point I want to touch on is the measuring of the exciting activities. Uh, I already mentioned before, but we wanted to understand how the setting activities were reported. So did you, use a, did you use a standardized system to report the setting activities or use an arbitrary one? And also we wanted to check how they were measured. Uh, questionnaires, reports, interviews, uh, which methods were used. Uh, so in total, we included 64 studies in the, um, in the, in the review. And unfortunately, most of them were, were still of males. Uh, we know female, studies on females are, are starting to, to increase now, which is very good. For data collection methods, most of the studies used reports followed by video analysis. Uh, especially in the last, I would say, five, seven years, the number of studies using video analysis is, is increasing very sensibly. Uh, which is, I think, is positive because with video analysis, the quality or the details, at least, of the of data you can report is uh, is substantially uh, wider and better. Uh, just a little note: you may notice that the, the math doesn't add up. Uh, so simply because some studies used multiple methods, maybe, maybe one study used video analysis in interview. So. The, the sum of these might be over 64, and the same goes for other for other variables. We reference to injury definition again. Only 13 studies out of 64 use a standard case definition. And uh, overall, uh, the vast majority of the studies reported that injuries occurred in general without specifying their body location, while others reported. Uh, the, the specific body locations where the injuries occurred, and of course, allowed an uh, analysis by body location. Uh, so, again, data were not meta analyzed because of what we have discussed so far, uh, and they were reported only descriptively. In the next few slides, I'm going to present the data for all the for, from all the studies. But if you are particularly interested in a specific population, I don't know, uh, only females or only males or um, only professional athletes or a specific injury type, uh, I created this interactive dashboard uh, on Tableau, which is freely available online. Uh, you can you can easily uh, just scan the QR code and uh, you have access to it, or if it, anything doesn't work, of course, just drop me an email, I'll send you the link. Um, so yeah, in the next two slides, I'm, I present the, the injuries occurred to, to you know, you know, reporting in all studies. So for general injuries, so all the injuries without any specific body location, jewels represented uh, higher activities. Um, while blocking and changing direction were reported as inciting activities uh, leading to a small percentage of injuries, both in males and in females. Other results, as you can see here, are quite heterogeneous. So it's, it's difficult uh, to interpret. Uh, one thing we try to do is, uh, to con is we try to consider only the studies that use video analysis because we believed VMS can be arguably uh, more a, a bit more precise as a method. However, we found little differences with the results reported by, by all the studies. Uh, one thing that we noticed is that in the included studies, it seemed that running activities may contribute to a higher percentage of injuries in males than in females. Uh, we tried, we wanted to, uh, we tried to analyze the differences between males and females and between training and match injuries. However, the data were, were very limited, so we decided not to.
Uh, with reference to ACL injuries, uh, in total 12 studies analyzed uh, ACL injuries. And again, the results were quite heterogeneous, both in the categories that we use to classify the setting activities, but also in the original activities reported by the studies. So not the categories that I, we created, but the, the data reported by the studies. Uh, again, considering only video studies that use the video analysis, the results appear slightly more consistent and the duals clearly appear as the risk activity of, for ACL injuries. Um, uh, while other activities either show heterogeneous results, such as change in direction, ball handling, or account for a very small percentage of injuries. Uh, this was uh, uh, quite interesting, if you like, because it's been largely reported in the literature, you know, that the load at which the ACL is exposed to increases when the knees in knee valgus and intra rotation, uh, which usually occurs during a change in direction or when players perform a tackle. So we would have expected to observe a high prevalence of um, ACL injuries occurring during these activities, but this was not always the case. Uh, indeed, dual activities and change in direction contributed to a high percentage of injuries in some, in some studies. Uh, but in other studies, they either accounted for a very little for very little percentage or no injuries were reported to have occurred during change of direction. So in some study, uh, out of 100 injuries, no injuries were reported to have occurred during a change of direction, which, which is a bit uh, uh, unexpected, at least. So uh, we, it, we did this might probably be caused by the different classification used to report the exciting activities. So even if uh, a change in direction and tackling and landing are expected to be among the main activities leading to ACL injuries in football, the results are, are currently, uh, it's, it's difficult to confirm this hypothesis, let's say. So we need to further investigate this. Uh, with reference to tight injuries, we had four studies reporting the, reported on tight injuries in general, and two studies specifically reporting on hamstring. So running activities were, were the most reported uh, activities, uh, accounting for more than a half of the total number of injuries. Uh, while kicking was the second main activities reported uh, for uh, reported for hamstring and tight injuries. Again, considering only video analysis study, uh, results were quite similar. Um, one thing uh, I, I, we noticed is that um, sprinting and running were, were the most prevalent activities lead to tight injuries, while lunging, lunging and accelerating were the most prevalent activities lead to hamstring injuries. Uh, these results are apparently uh, partially in accordance with what the uh, previous reported and hypothesized in the literature. Uh, however, even if the results confirm the previous hypothesis, there are still some uh, concerns, still some cautions need to be taken to, to report, to, to interpret these results. Uh, there are multiple reasons, I'll try to be short, but the main one is that the two mains, I would say. The first one is that the running speed, the running intensity, it's not clear how it was measured. It wasn't measured by GPS, so it's not clear which criteria the researchers, researchers used to classify an injury as a high running, high speed running, high intensity running, acceleration, and so on. Uh, the second is that it, high intensity or high speed speed was not defined. So if I ask you, what do you mean for high speed running? Someone might say 25 kilo, about 25, someone might say about 24, about 28, 30, 20, 19. We know every, every, every GPS has its own, uh, its own uh, defined setting. And uh, there is actually a nice review uh, published a couple of years ago that collect, collect, collated all the different uh, 
speed bands used by in different studies. So if we didn't, if we do not define what we mean for running intensity, for run, for high speed running, for high uh, intensity running, it's it's really difficult as a, as a practitioner to to apply the results from these studies in in, in my in my job, which is what I think research should uh, sh should do, or one of the things research should do. So again, uh, uh, these results really interpreted really to be interpreted carefully because uh, of the of the methodological limitation we're going to discuss later, but also of because of the details we had just touched on, and even because only two studies analyze specifically hamstring injuries. So it's it's only two studies. We need to be aware of it. Um, lastly, on the last type of injury, uh, touching on hip and groin, uh, they were analyzed by four injuries, with high intensity running and kicking uh, being the most one, but the most common one. Again, interesting to note that only two studies reported any injury occurred during uh, change in direction, which means that other in uh, the remaining two studies, no injuries were reported to have occurred during change in direction. Uh, only, one, uh, only one study analyzed uh, the, 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 the specifically the, the adductor longus injuries in, uh, with, uh, with the video analysis and reported that uh, change in direction, kicking uh, were the most prevalent activities. Again, these results are partially consistent with available literature for the biomechanics of injury. Um, However, and even it makes all even sense because we know that uh, adductor injuries are more common in um, sports that have uh, a high, high number of uh, change in direction, acceleration, deceleration. So it makes sense both from a mechanical point of view, if you like, but also from, uh, um, from what we observe in other sports. Uh, however, uh, same as discussed for the hamstring, very little studies, methodological limitation to consider so please be careful when we uh, interpret and apply these results. Now, I've been stressing uh, quite frequently about the methodological limitations. So it's about time we, we, we touch on them. Uh, again, uh, the paper is, is, very, is way more uh, uh, detailed. So I'll touch just on the, on the, main, on the main topic and the main points. Uh, so overall, 76% per, of the items that evaluated the internal, external, internal valid, validity were scored as medium or high risk of bias. Okay, uh, simply if you see red and yellow, it's not good. So in many studies, the vast majority of the studies um, showed uh, medium or high risk of bias for the most vast majority of the items. Um, more than 70% of the studies did not clearly specify the target population. So it's really difficult to understand whether the study population was a close representation of the target population. Uh, again, 55% of the studies did not clearly report information such as the age, the country of competition, the playing level, um, and so on, which makes very, very difficult to apply, uh, to understand to which population we can apply these, uh, these results. Um, again, as uh, reported by other systematic reviews, uh, a very high percentage of the studies did not use uh, a defined case definition. Uh, this means that some studies in defined injuries as a 48 hour um, an, in a, an availability or a one match missed 72 hours uh, and, and so on. And this is something uh, very, uh, how can I say, this, this is a big problem to be honest, because uh, we have case definition so that all, all the different studies can be compared. But if my study defined injuries as a time loss injury. So if you lose one, one second of a session, it's considered an injury. And if a second study consider injuries only as a seven days missed. So if you miss less than five days, it's not considered an injury. 
we cannot we cannot really compare this because all the non-severe injuries that in my study would be an injury in this case will not and even if we consider the injury mechanism or the inside inactivities this will uh, influence the results because it might be i don't know but it might be that less severe injuries have different mechanisms and different activities leading to this injury than severe injuries, the more severe injuries. So if we define the case separately, this will naturally influence the results we get. And uh, as a consequence, it will influence everything we do with those results. And the last point to touch on was that is actually the main limitation in the included studies which was the, the use of non-standardized system to classify the, the inciting activities. And um, this led the researcher to classify and report this data using arbitrary classification, which is probably among the main cause of the big heterogeneity that is, uh, is, um, is, uh, is shown in the, in the, in the graphs I, I showed before. Uh, just, that just to give you an example, more than a hundred different activities have been reported by all by different studies. More than one hundred. Uh, so this this is probably the biggest problem, in my opinion. We identify. So we also try to to provide a solution. Uh, very very clearly, this is not the solution. This is hopefully the first step toward a solution. So what we did following the systematic review, uh, we tried to develop a standardized system to report the activities leading to injury in football. It's been accepted in uh, sports med, it should be published hopefully by the end of the month. Um, but so we simply tried, we ran a um, kind of consensus study uh, to try to develop this system involving various stakeholders. And uh, we, th this is available on an Excel file. So you can download the, the Excel file from, uh, from OSF. This is the name if you want to check the name or this is the QR code if you want to download the file. And it's really an Excel file color coded made. Uh, we try to make it as clear as possible. If you look at it now without reading the paper, it will be a bit difficult to understand it, but there are guidelines and again, of course, any question, drop me an email and uh, very, very happy to help. So in conclusion, to just to wrap up very quickly, uh, for ACL injuries, it, it seems that jewels and pressing might be the most prevalent activities leading to ACL injuries. Uh, high intensity running and kicking seems to be seem to be the most prevalent activities leading to tight injuries. A uh, change in direction and kicking seem to be the most prevalent activities leading to hip and groin injuries. Again, um, there were few important few but important uh, methodological limitations in the studies, the main ones being the different injury definitions and the different classification of the inciting activities. Uh, I just want to, to conclude maybe just with a little reminder for, for everyone. I, what I, I, we know that the, we collect, especially nowadays, we collect a great amount of data. And the reason for collecting this data is that we try to analyze them to obtain information that then we can guide the decision-making process, which is very important. However, we, it's very important to keep in mind that the quality of the data and the quality of the analysis will influence the information that will influence the decision. So if we collect and analyze data uh, without following the, the best available guidelines, uh, the information we get from this data might not be very accurate and the decision we make following this information might not be the best. So yeah, thank you, thank you for, for the attention. And of course, any question, please feel free to ask. And if you want to get in touch, these are my contact details.